I know. I know. Late round, overvalued wide receivers. I mean, who cares? Who cares? Once you get to the 12th round, you're throwing darts just like the rest of your league. But, but, I mean, there is a way that we can try and look at some of these guys. And as you've seen from the other videos that I've put out so far, like early round wide receivers, like mid round wide receivers, there's an objective way for you to try and evaluate some of those guys. So, one more time, let's go ahead and look at some of these wide receivers that might be overvalued. But now in the late round, though, we'll do this as always by the numbers. So what's going on, everybody? Uh, we've got one more video here in the wide receiver series looking at some of the overvalued guys. But first, I want to take a look back at last week's uh, video. I did have a comment when I talked about Brandon Ayuk and his situation for 2022 and thinking that his connection with Trey Lance won't be as strong, I mean, given Trey Lance's running nature. But the comment did ask to take a look at some of the routes where Ayuk will be going across the field. That's where Trey Lance is strong. That's where Brandon Ayuk is strong as well. And by the numbers, that does seem to bear out. I mean, I took a look at Lance's EPA per pass across the middle and Brandon Ayuk's EPA per target over similar routes. And so for post routes, digs, curls, I mean, those types of routes that are kind of, you know, getting a moving across the middle. Yeah, both were fairly efficient in that area. So I do think that is something to take away when looking at Ayuk's outlook for 2022, where it's not just doom and gloom for him, at least at this point. Now, the red zone, I think, is still a concern for me, but especially now with the Debo Samuel trade rumors, or at least, you know, the request that's been out there. I mean, of course, there could be some more workload coming his way, but at least that's still at least a positive takeaway from him. So I love getting comments like that, that at least force me to take a look at each wide receiver, their situation a bit more in depth. So always I mean, drop a comment, let me know what your perspective is, and then we'll kind of, you know, keep the dialogue going as we start to learn more. But all right, late round wide receiver, let's go ahead and hop right on into it because you're throwing darts just like everybody else. And if you're expecting at least some production out of them, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, if your expectation is that the guy you're drafting is going to have at least one appearance in the top 24, 50-50 shot. And that's been the case over the past three seasons, like over a 50% hit rate. I mean, for top 12, if you're looking for a wide receiver one, a little less, but about a third of the time. But now if you want that sustained production, maybe a few games here or there as either a top 12 wide receiver or a top 24 wide receiver, wide receiver two on your team. OK, that drops down to about seven, eight, nine percent somewhere in there. And with an average of 75 wide receivers typically being drafted past the 12th round, that's where our selection has to be a bit more rigorous instead of just saying, well, I like this guy. I like that guy. I like the team that he plays for. I'm just going to go ahead and draft this guy. I mean, let's let's think about this just a little bit more. And of course, I got you covered Like when it comes to at least trying to pick apart some of these guys from an analytical perspective. And of course, the first guy that I wanted to talk about is Devontae Parker. Moving over from Miami, or I guess not moving over, we're moving up to New England in order to play with Mac Jones. I mean, if you look at I mean, the Patriots and their uh, and their passing rate, this is just pulling off of fantasy pros. I mean, the Patriots had the one of the lowest rates in the league in terms of passing to their wide receivers. I mean, remember all those touchdowns that went to Hunter Henry? I mean, all the stuff that we were expecting to go to Johnny Smith and never made it there, even the passes to Ramondre Stevenson. Now we're expecting... Devontae Parker, who's coming over from having about a 22% target share in Miami to now having possibly, I mean, something less there, like in, uh, in New England. Now, this is also one of the teams that does the exact same thing once they get into the red zone. I mean, they have one of the lowest passing rates to their wide receivers once they get into the red zone as well. So if the target share is going to be an issue for Devontae Parker, on top of the red zone equity as well, I don't know. I, I have some concerns with him going there, even if the target should be at least fairly vol voluminous, like for Parker overall, but the touchdown equity is something that I'm concerned about. And of course, another guy, Miko Hardman, Kansas City Chiefs. Now, I already talked about Marquez Valdez Scantling. I gave the argument against him, and I'm going to do the same thing for Miko Hardman. I mean, while his ADP is cheaper, so you might want to pick him up, and I can definitely see the logic for him. But again, he's now being, uh, he's still attached to a quarterback who's had a declining average depth of target and also a declining deep ball rate over the past three seasons. And if Mikol is already third on the team in terms of red zone targets, now with the departure of Tyreek Hill, 
Uh, I, could, I could totally see like some folks like, and of course, Juju Smith-Schuster are really, are we really assuming he's going to pick up that type of slack? I mean, okay, fine. But if that is, if you're going into it with that type of logic, I think I get it. But also with MVS being a semi-redundant asset, like from a deep ball perspective, I don't know. I have at least a few more concerns for uh, with him that way. And I would rather focus on the guys that I know are going to get targets both overall and both in the red zone, which should be Juju Smith-Schuster. It should be Travis Kelsey. And then, of course, have a little less of guys like Miko Hardman and NBS. Uh, last guy that I want to talk about, uh, kick it over to the Rams real quick. Let's go ahead and take a look at Van Jefferson. Now, overall, Van Jefferson, his targets per route run throughout the regular season, fairly strong, 17, 18, 19% throughout the entire season. And that's with the, the injury to Robert Woods bringing in Odell Beckham. I mean, plenty of turmoil, or at least turnover within that passing offense, but still had a strong overall performance. But his red zone performance, I mean, his red zone opportunity was one of the lowest, like on his own team. I mean, he had 16 red zone targets throughout the entire season. I mean, Robert Woods had 16 in nine games. I mean, Odell Beckham had nine and seven games. So if he's already competing for red zone targets, they bring in a guy like Allen Robinson. And on top of that, like the role that we assume Ben Jefferson to have, which is that deep ball role. I mean, heck, I mean, Odell Beckham and Cooper Cup both had more deep, uh, deep targets than Van Jefferson last season. So, I mean, and also the guy that's coming in behind him, Allen Robinson, he had 14 deep ball targets. Ben Jefferson had 16. So it seems like there's plenty of competition for Van Jefferson in all areas of the field. I would rather take my draft assets and look elsewhere. So, I mean, Hardman, Parker, Jefferson, I mean, plenty of other options like there towards the back end of the end of the league or back end of your draft. I mean, if you're looking for potential wide receiver twos, definitely take a look at Victoria's uh, Victoria's shorts that she's been looking at. Definitely take a look at Alex Caruso stuff here on the Football Guys channel. And as always, I will catch y'all in the lobby. Peace.